probably heard the phrase, her face said it all. At first, it might sound strange. You'd expect her words, not her facial expressions, to make statements. But if we look at real world situations, lots of things impact how we make meaning, from how close we stand to each other to how we incorporate touch into our conversations. Researchers have used observation and interpretation to learn a lot about how nonverbal communication varies across cultures. And today, we're digging into some of them. I'm Cassandra Ryder, and this is Study Hall. Intro to Human Communication. To categorize some of the nonverbal influences on our communication, we have some different terms to discuss, including proxemics, chronemics, and haptics. Proxemics, or the study of how space and distance impact our communication, looks at both literal and figurative space. Figurative space might sound odd, but think about how we describe relationships, like a close friend or a distant relation. Literal space has an influence too. Researchers find that different cultures have distinct ideas of personal space or how close we'd physically stand when talking to someone. These distances also shift between acquaintances, friends, and family members or romantic partners. E.T. Hall labels the zones where our proxemic distance shifts as public, social, personal, and intimate. At a concert, you might feel totally comfortable talking with someone standing right in front of you, but in a park, that kind of closeness might seem really weird. Certain environments, like public transportation, force us into closer proximity than usual with strangers, but rules still govern the space. Behaviors like staring or talking loudly on a phone are often considered breaches of etiquette. Speaking of etiquette, who makes the rules and who gets to enforce them? These questions lead us to look at territoriality, the way that people seem to claim space and make rules for it. The three main divisions for territory are primary, secondary, and public spaces. Primary spaces are the ones you feel the most control over like your bedroom. If this is the space you specifically associate with being yours, you feel like you have a say in how people communicate with you in this environment. Your primary territories are places where you're more able to dress the way you want and maintain a comfortable distance from others. Others who come into your primary space take cues from you, such as whether you wear shoes inside. Secondary spaces are more outside of our control, but we still find ways to set limits within them. A great example is how even when seating is technically open in a classroom, people tend to settle into their spots and not move much during a semester. They may not control much about the classroom, but seeing the room from the same perspective each week brings a bit of control, as does knowing who will sit near them. From public parks to street sidewalks, public territories are much more open. The rules can blur in these spaces. Some people might see a sidewalk as a great spot to sell their music, while some see it as exclusively for walking, and others prefer it to be open to biking or skateboarding. If you've ever seen a free concert in a park, there are often people setting out chairs hours before the music to stake a claim, even though it's technically public space. Chronemics refers to the study of how time impacts communication. And clearly, time can be a factor in lots of our interactions. First, consider cultural time. Cultures are often subdivided into two groups, monochronic and polychronic. Cultures that are monochronic schedule time rigidly, usually doing one thing at a time. Polychronic cultures tend to see things more fluidly, with less prior scheduling and with the option to let activities blur into each other. A person from a monochronic culture might see someone else as being late to a meeting, which has a hard start and stop. But the polychronic person might actually have been finishing up another meeting and bringing that person along as a valuable new addition to the next one, combining and blurring two previously scheduled events. There's a power element to time as well. Busy medical specialists may have a long wait list to get an appointment and still have people waiting a long time in the office. That's because a specialist's time is seen as highly valued and everyone else's time is simply, well, not as valued. If a major world leader or a celebrity gets behind schedule, they have an army of administrators to adjust all subsequent appearances, even if it means hundreds of people are left waiting. Just look at the impact of being late at different workplaces and you'll see how power impacts timing. A new intern is reprimanded, but when a VP is late, people assume she just had something come up. Chronemics also includes how long we talk. You may have met someone who answers questions with only a few words, leaving you feeling like they are being cagey or not sharing what needs to be shared. On the other hand, most of us have met someone who ignores subtle fidgeting and other nonverbal cues that they have been talking for way too long. We've spent a long time unconsciously studying how long we can speak per turn of conversation. Anyone who apologizes and says, I'm rambling, may feel like they've stepped over this unconscious limit. We also figure out turn-taking patterns by unconsciously studying social situations. Over time, we pick up information about how frequently people talk and the way they use nonverbal cues, like touching others. Speaking of touching, haptics, the study of communication by touch, 
is very important. Socially, we decide on whether a firm handshake or a gentle one is preferred. We learn what kind of touch is appropriate or comfortable by spending time around other people. The combination of proxemics, chronemics, and haptics shapes the way that we add nonverbal dimensions to our communication. However, we're also always interacting with built and curated environments around us. The way we speak in a tea room full of delicate antiques and decor might be different from how we speak in the bleachers of a boisterous soccer game. In every environment, small features like lighting to decorations to clutter can impact how we speak to each other and are themselves outgrowths of communication of whoever owns that space. Let's look at how a combination of these nonverbal signals could work to convey particular messages. Lily owns a farm, including a barn that was going mostly unused. She decided to set it up as a meeting space, and in using it for different kinds of meetings, she realized how much nonverbal cues and environmental factors impact how people interact. A workplace chose to rent her barn for a professional development offsite. They created a space where each table had paper and a pen to take notes, a big screen for slide presentations, and a podium for a speaker. Even during breaks, the sparse surroundings seemed to make the space feel more like a workplace. She saw team members interacting at a professional distance from each other, even as they had casual conversations. They behaved in a very monochronic way, carefully filtering back to their tables after breaks and keeping things moving in an orderly way. On the other hand, when they booked a wedding in the barn, the decorations turned the barn into a space that emphasized love and was full of photos from the couple's life together. The music, lighting, and order of events was much more fluid. And when the big day arrived, it was clear that the attendees were close. There were a lot more hugs at this event, along with louder voices, and a more fluid understanding of timing dominated the interactions. As she booked other events, from a square dance to a networking event for local business owners, Lily saw different levels of formality and intimacy, professionalism, and casualness. In each event, people learn from each other and use their past experiences to determine the right combination of personal space, good timing, and touch. Lily found it fascinating how the expectations that different guests brought to her barn and the ways that the barn was filled with furniture and decor could change how people communicated in it. Proxemics, chronemics, and haptics aren't just idle curiosities of barn owners who find communication fascinating. They are also key aspects of how many people do their jobs. Marketers know that they need to place marketing and advertising materials into a world where time and distance impact whether someone pays attention or ignores a message. Interior designers need to use these nonverbal experiences to make sure that, for instance, an office designed for collaboration doesn't have features that make everyone afraid to speak up. It's also important on an interpersonal level. Perhaps our voice is saying, I value you and want to hear what you need to say to me. But our nonverbal cues show that we're feeling like our time is being wasted through movements like checking our phone or moving to distance ourselves from the person we're talking to. Because we're almost always communicating something with time, touch, and space, we can become more intentional users of our own nonverbal cues and work to bring all of our intentions into alignment. If we're not sure what we're communicating with these elements, talking to those we trust most can give us a lot of insight into whether they see us as distant and aloof, too chatty during time crunches, or conveying any of a lot of other possibilities. Misunderstanding can still occur, but we're much more likely to share a message that is well-received and understood if we can align our voices with our nonverbal cues. And after all, aren't we all here to become better communicators? Thanks for watching Study Hall, Intro to Human Communication, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you liked this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.